Lamentations chapter 3. We'll read one verse together. And let's read verse 25. Lamentations chapter 3. Let's read verse 25 out loud together. Ready? The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your word, your promises. Uh, and we thank you for being a God who always keeps his promises. Now, God, as we study tonight, I pray that you'd help us, you would encourage us, that we might find our encouragement in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Um, I don't plan on keeping you a long time this evening. Give back a little bit of time that I've taken uh, from from time to time. <clears throat> uh, sometimes I get done, I upload the message, I say, "Wow, that was 50 minutes." Um, and uh, then I always think my mom would say something like, "If you can't get your message across in 20 minutes, you're not being very effective." And uh, my thought is, it's not my fault if people don't listen quickly, uh, but. Um, uh, from time to time, it's it's a, a more simpler truth, and uh, I have two points tonight, and sometimes it's the sub-points that get us, and sometimes it's uh, uh, 40 minutes of introduction and five minutes of, of message. Uh, somebody asked Shay Frank Norris once how long it took him to write a sermon, and he answered with however many years old he was and 10 minutes. Uh, so if he was 45, he'd say it takes 45 years and 10 minutes. Um, and, and so, you know, it took me my whole life to get the knowledge and everything, the experience needed for this and 10 minutes to organize the thoughts on, on a piece of paper. It takes me a little longer than that. Um, but th there's, there's a couple things that uh, that are found in this verse. First of all, it says the Lord is good, and then it, it gives uh, who He's good to, and really God is good all the time, and He's good to all of us. The Bible tells us the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. So you can have a saved person living next door to an unsaved person, a good Christian next door to a very worldly, carnal, uh, even evil person. And when it rains, that rain hits both of their houses. Uh, if they ha both have a garden, both of those gardens are getting rain. And nobody is ever going to stand before God and, and be able to rightfully accuse him. And, and really at that point, they wouldn't even wrongly accuse him of not having been good to them throughout their lives. And sometimes people think, well, God just isn't very good to me. And, and God must be angry at me and he's he's happy with them he's good to them over there but he hasn't been very good to me in my life and and i want us to look here at, at, at a couple things that god says about that he says the lord is good first of all unto them that wait for him unto them that wait for him let me mention a couple things about that i think <clears throat> because i don't think the bible always only means one Thing at the exclusion of being able to mean other things as well. And, and one of the things we're, we are to wait for God on, the Bible clearly tells us we're to wait for his return. And we're to be waiting for Jesus to come back. And, you know, I spoke to somebody this morning. They said, you know, I remember when I lived at this certain house and I'd be doing dishes and looking out the window and, and I'd be washing those dishes and looking out the window and wondering, is this going to be the day? Is this going to be it when he comes back? And now, obviously that wasn't the day back then, but now we are that much closer and we look around at the events going on in the world and, and you know, the, the events going on in our own country and, and on the, the, the debate stage and then the, uh, the pretend interview after, after that. Um, the, and, and I like the way they say, this is the president's first sit-down interview after the debate. This is the first sit-down interview in how long? Mm -hmm. Not just after the debate, it's when was the last time he sat down and let somebody ask him questions? And then the other thing I want to, where was his necktie? If he's showing up I, as the president, I'm being interviewed as the president. I'm going to have a necktie on. 
And what a disrespect for the office and, and how little he thinks of the office, how casually he takes that position. And, and, but anyhow, um, but we should, be, we should be waiting for his return. And, and oh, the Bible says here that wait for him, not just wait on him. Although the Bible in Isaiah, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. This is specifically waiting for him. And we definitely should be waiting for his return. Um, and then also, I, I should be waiting for him in matters of my life. And, and, and so what, what I mean by that is I should be waiting for him to be involved in those things instead of me um, forcing the matter. So how do I wait for him in, in, in the different situations, different matters of my life? Well, here's something that I that uh, that I need to I'd like to do. I'd like to move forward on. Here's a direction I'd like to. Here's something I'd like to do, and, and you know, certainly not a uh, uh, obviously not a sinful thing. He's not going to get involved in that. But uh, for example, God said it's not good that man should be alone. And he said I'm going to make a wife for him, and, and so <clears throat> it's not wrong for a young man. To grow up and want to get married. That's not a sinful and wrong thing. But he should not force the issue. There's something I heard a preacher say. He said, God put Adam to sleep. And then he brought a woman to him and woke him up. And what he was encouraging the young men to do. He said, put that part of you to sleep. And let God bring somebody to you. You focus on the things you ought to be focusing on and don't worry about that. Don't force that issue. Don't run around chasing, looking. I got to find somebody. I got to get married or I'm going to be an old man before I ever find a woman to be a wife to me. Put that to sleep. And God, uh, wait for God Amen. to be involved in that. And so that's just one area. Any major decision and really the minor decisions end up adding up to the major decisions. But, but especially we need to we need to get in the habit of waiting for God in those things that we would consider minor, insignificant, not very important situations and matters. And that way we're already in the habit of waiting for him. Uh, and so, you know, any other major, I'm going to change careers. I've been 30 years at this and now I'm going to shift gears and go that way. Uh, I know a pastor that uh, uh, had pastored, uh, he may have started the church where he was pastoring and been there for uh, some 30 years or more. And then uh, went to the mission field. And <clears throat> he did quickly and easily. He, he said, well, I believe God's calling me to go somewhere else. But he waited. He didn't say, I, I want to go out. I want to go to another country. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. He, he waited for that. And, and uh, so it's, it's me not forcing. That's part of what waiting for God is, is me not forcing the issue I have to find a way to make this happen. I don't think God is against men getting married. But we should certainly wait for him. You know, Adam's naming all the animals. Mr. Lion, Mrs. Lion. Mr. Giraffe, Mrs. Giraffe. And he gets through the whole line. There's no Mrs. Adam. I got to do something about this. That's not what he said. I think he realized, well, I'm the only one all alone here. And God looked at him and said, that's not good. I need to do something to keep him out of trouble. Uh, no, that wasn't. <laughs> that's, that's paraphrasing uh, and badly. But God did say, that's the first thing God looked at and said, that's not good. Everything, all of his other creative acts, he looked at and said, that's good. That's good. After he created Eve, he didn't just say that's good. God looked at everything and saw that it was very good at that point. And, and so, but Adam waited. He didn't force it. He didn't go to God and say, now, we got to do something about this. We got to straighten this out. I've got to, I've got to find something. I've got to, uh, I got to do something. No, he waited and God got involved. Another part of, of waiting on him in matters of my life is I'm asking for and expecting his involvement. So how can I wait upon God? I can ask him, God, I need you to get involved in this. 
And not only ask him, but I'm expecting you to be involved in this. I need, I've got to have your involvement in this. Uh, and so I expect you, and I'm going to leave it alone. I'll go along with it, and I'll take steps in that direction when the road is open and, and right ahead of me. No, I'm not going to look way down there and say, well, the road's closed. I'm not going to make any progress. It, right ahead of me, if, that, if I can take the next step, I will. But I'm not going to force it and, 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 and create the road. Uh, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. And so I'll let you guide and direct out the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I'll let you order my steps, and, and I'm going to take those steps as I can. But I'm not going to force this issue. I have to have, and I expect to have your involvement. And that's a way in which we wait for him. Certainly we wait for his soon return, but we don't wait around doing nothing. I've got things I've got to deal with. You know, you, I, I, you start growing up. And the more you grow up, it seems like there's more for you to deal with. And, uh, all right, graduated high school. Uh, maybe I should add a little bit more education. And so I'm going to wait for God to guide in that. I'm going to be asking, while I approach that, I'm going to be asking, God, I'm going to need you involved. And I, I, I expect for you to open doors where you want me to walk and close doors where you don't want me to go. And we have an expectation. I'm not going to force that. Every time I've forced the matter on any issue, it has gone badly. And, and when I look back on it, it's almost like I can hear God saying, you should have waited for me. One of the places where, where my dad ministered in Columbia early on when they got down there <clears throat> was way out in the boonies. I don't know if I was even born yet. I heard him tell stories about it. I saw pictures. Um, he had uh, slides of it and and uh, I mean they went out in the boonies they slept in hammocks and and um, they would get to a certain place and from there a man would meet them and guide them out and they had to walk I mean there was <laughs> dad had a four-wheel drive vehicle he had a, a Willis Jeep and there was there came a point where you couldn't go any further even in a four-wheel drive vehicle here's where you get out leave that parked and we're gonna walk to the village and he was he was still fairly young at that point and hey let's go let's get there I've got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with these people and the guide said slow down they said why we got to get there he said no you don't want to get ahead of me on this but why not he said we're going to take it easy and we're going to give the snakes plenty of time to get out of the way now, Dad had some go getiveness and he wanted to get going and, and get down that path and get to that village and get set up and, and, and get the Bible opened up and preach the gospel of Jesus to the people. But in, in failing to wait for the man that was there to guide them, he would have gotten snake bit. And there's so many times in life where we try to force things. I've got to make this happen. I've got to get there. We fail to wait upon God and we wind up snake bit. We wind up in trouble. So the first thing about this verse is the Lord is good unto them that wait for him. You'll find that if you wait for God, you'll be glad that you did. And you say, boy, God sure was good to me there. And God says, well, you waited for me. You waited for me. But we get ahead of ourselves. When we get ahead of God, we leave him out of it altogether. I've got this. I'm going to take care of this. I, I read a book on how to do this. I got this all figured out. I'm not even going to involve God in this. And then the, the disaster ensues. Well, God sure wasn't very good to me there. Well, you didn't wait for it. Don't blame him for his absence. You, you ran off down the road without him. And if you'd have waited for him, you would have gotten to the other side of this and say, man, God sure was good to me. God sure was good. God sure was good. Those that wait on And then the next part of the verse says, um, uh, <clears throat> let me find the verse. 25, that's what I mean. They're also here. Right to the soul that seeketh him. So number one is wait for him. Number two is seek him. Look for God's involvement in your life. God's involvement in the lives of man. And 
Well, there's 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 so many people discouraged. I remember when when uh, Bill Clinton was in office, and <laughs> there, there was a man he pastored near here at one time that he was in evangelism now and had him come in and preach and he did a good job. Oh, he'd get so aggravated about about the the stuff that Bill Clinton was doing, and you could tell his blood pressure was going up. Uh, he'd get so angry and so upset about all the the, the foolishness that was going on. And, in and around the White House directly connected to the Clintons and what he was guilty of there was he was failing to seek God in that God was in that God's sovereign I'll tell you nobody makes it to the White House without God allowing it Nobody makes it to the position of king, prime minister, president, or whatever without God having allowed that to happen. The powers that be are ordained by God. Now, that doesn't mean, well, I'm the king, I'm ordained by God, I can do no wrong. It doesn't mean that at all, although royalty tried to interpret it that way. And, and uh, we are chosen by God. That means our law is the same as God's law. No, no, no. That means you are there to serve God. If God hired you, you work for him <laughs> and how would he do it? Well, Jesus came and he served the people. Um, he fed the hungry. He brought healing to the sick and the lame. And, and uh, man, he got, uh, he got most upset with the most hypocritical of them, those that felt they were entitled to something. Uh, <clears throat> but we need, to, we need to seek God's involvement. We need to seek God. Whatever you're looking for, I've said this before, the Bible says, seek and ye shall find. So whatever it is you're looking for, you'll find that. You'll find that. And when we look at things in our own past, in our own history, and we say, well, that was an unpleasant thing. And, and uh, if we're looking for someone to blame, we'll find someone to blame. And then that's... Uh, if, if, we're, if I'm looking... For a way in which to be a victim, oh, I guarantee you, I'll find it. I'll find it. Well, it's not my fault. This happened to me when I was five years old. And that's why I messed up now. Is, is that why that happened? Is, did, did God allow that to happen to me when I was just a little kid? So that I would have an excuse for being messed up as an adult? See, if, if I'm looking for that, that's what I find. But is that really the purpose? Was that God's purpose for that happening? Now, if I go back and I say, I need to find out. I need to look for God. I need to seek Him in that. That was a horrible thing that happened. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But, you know, because that happened, I can speak to others that have had bad things happen to them. And I can say, let me tell you how good God is. And how can I say God is good when something bad happened to me in my past? I can say it because I have sought Him. Amen. And when you seek Him, it doesn't matter what bad things happen. Oh, you know, we can look at, at the, the, the journeying, the traveling of the children of Israel as they left Egypt and headed to the promised land. Oh, all the bad things that happened to them. I mean, they just got out of town and it wasn't long till their water ran out. And they started looking around. They said, there's no water out here. What a horrible thing. Our animals are going to die of thirst. Our children are going to die of thirst right in front of our eyes. We're going to die of thirst. What a bad thing. They went, and God provided water. They went a little bit further. There's, oh, there's water here, but it's bitter. It's brackish. You can't drink that water. It's like poison to us. And God told Moses, take that log over there and throw that in there. And, and that purified the water. And it seemed like every so often they'd end up somewhere, no water. And on occasion, no food. Oh, here's another occasion. There's venomous uh, serpents coming out and biting us. And we're dying from being snake bit. And the bandits and the enemies and people just uh, being picked off, the ones that were out on the fringes, on the edges, they, 
They didn't want to get in real close and be identified, but they also, they left Egypt and they part of the mixed multitude. And we could look over the next 40 years from them leaving Egypt to the time that they actually went into the promised land. Look at all the bad things that happened to them. And if you're looking for the bad things that happened to them, you're going to find the bad things that happened to them. But if you're looking for God, you're going to say, look, when they were thirsty there, God gave them water. When they were thirsty there, God gave them water. When they were thirsty there, God said, Moses, there's a rock up there. Go hit it with your stick. There's water going to come out of that rock. Really? Yes. And it's interesting because Moses believed enough he hit it with a stick. How much faith did that take? Enough faith to pick up the stick? And <laughs> I don't know if anybody's looking or not. What if this doesn't work? I'm going to look like a fool. You'll always be on the winning side when you do what God tells you to do. No matter what you think you're going to look like or what other people think you look like, you do what God says to do. You seek Him. And when we seek Him, we've got to realize we got to get it, boy, we need to get a good hold of this, of God's sovereignty. God saw, I looked up the word sovereign, and it means supreme in power. Superior to all others. And, and there were several different lines of definition, and each one of them seemed to have that word supreme. Supreme in this area, supreme in authority, supreme in power. So I looked up the word supreme, and it said the highest in authority. And so if God is the highest in authority, and He is, that means that nothing happens without Him authorizing it. Well, that bombing happened. He authorized that bombing. Yeah. Well, that school shooting, did He authorize that? Yeah. yeah. What about Hamas invading it? Did He authorize that? Yes. What about all the Americans that are financially supporting Hamas now? Has he authorized that? Yeah. You think God couldn't, couldn't thwart their uh, electronic transfer of funds? I mean, he could cause a solar flare just as those funds are trans transferring over and fry the computers. And it's poof, all that money's gone, disappeared into thin air. So what's going on there? Well, I'll tell you, if you look for God's hand, and it may not always be evident, it may not always be visible, it may not always be clear exactly what he is working on accomplishing, but if you look for God's hand, you will find again and again and again that God is good to you. How can, how can I get God to be good to me like God's good to that guy? Well, wait for it. Wait for it. And seek Him. Look for Him. Search for Him. Boy, this is, this is, uh, this is not going right. I've got kids that are away from the Lord. What do I do? God's not being very good to me. Yes, God's being good to you. God's still at work there. Look for him and wait for him. Well, there was a lady in our church in Columbia. We used to have a, a prayer meeting on Wednesday nights uh, before the service. And she came every Wednesday. And her, her prayer request, Wednesday after Wednesday, month after month, and year after year, was pray for my husband to get saved. He's a drunkard and he beats me. By the way, you get cultures and societies that don't have Jesus and you end up with cultures and societies where the men are abusive to the women. Every culture that has exiled the God of the Bible out of their society, out of their people, the men are abusive violently towards their women. <clears throat> you'll not find any greater violence towards women than you find among the, the Muslim people. When they are mutilating their little girls <coughs> the way that they do. That, there's, um, anyways. Why? They don't, their God is not the God of the Bible. Allah is not his name. We don't get to name God what we, 
we have to ask, what is your name? And we'll let him identify himself to us. But year after year, pray for my husband. He's a drunk. And he beats me. Now others would have said, you need to take matters into your own hand. You need to force this situation. She waited on God. She waited. And the, the people in the church got together and they, they prayed. They they lifted her name up before God. They lifted her husband's name up before God. And she looked and she saw God's hand working in his life. And you know, there came a day where he darkened the doors of the church. And he sat through the preaching of the word. And he came forward in the invitation. He trusted Christ as his Savior. Life transformed. She didn't have to say, now honey, <clears throat> you're a Christian now. you got to dump out all the liquor. No, he went home. And he said, I'm a Christian now. I don't need this stuff anymore. And he poured it out and he got rid of it. And he didn't go back to it. And she didn't have to say, now honey, you're a Christian now. You can't smack me around anymore like you used to. No, he said, hey, I'm a Christian now. And I'm not going to mistreat you like I used to. But it took her waiting. And looking and expecting God to be involved. Why would she come back and pray and come back and pray and come back and pray? Because she expected God to put his hand on the situation and start directing and start moving things. And you know what? People would look at that and say, God was so good to her. Why? Well, she was waiting for him and she was looking for him. I'm looking for God to do something in the heart of my husband. I'm looking for God to do something in the life of my husband. I'm looking for God to do something in my household, underneath the roof of my house, where I live. Whew, God was good to her. How can I get God to be good to me? Wait for it. Wait for it. And look for it. Let's stand tonight, every head bowed, every eye closed. Well, if you're looking for a way to be a victim, Satan will give you a multitude of them. Oh, my dad yelled at me. My mom didn't stand up for me. My mom and dad didn't stay together. I didn't get fed the food that I wanted to eat. I got beans instead of rice. And I, didn't, I never got cereal. And nobody ever bought me a candy bar. And I never had a teddy bear. And you can find, if you are looking to be a victim, you'll find every every reason and, and Satan will start spoon feeding those things to you. And it'll all sound very well put together and like it makes sense. He'll send you people into your life that will confirm that reality for you. And you'll live a life of misery and spitefulness. And you'll go through life and saying, God's not been very good to me. But God sure has been good to you. Why don't I see it? You're not waiting for him. And you're not looking for him. You're not looking for him. When it all comes right down to it, God has been far better to us than what we deserve. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us your goodness. God, help us to see that goodness and help us to share that goodness with others, to show it to them that they may see it because we know that is, it is your goodness that leads us to repentance. God, as we see your goodness and your love for us, may that serve to help us and cause us to turn from the things we shouldn't be involved in and to turn to you to live more completely for you. Bless this invitation now and have your way in our hearts and in our lives for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So can of place. God spoken to your heart about something. Something you've been maybe whining and complaining about, moaning about, and no, God hasn't been very good to me. But God has shown you in his word, he has been, and you would see it if you'd wait for him. You'd see it if you looked for him. If you were seeking back and say, well, that didn't turn out the way it really should have. Could it be you got ahead of God? You didn't wait. You rushed in.
Our Heavenly Father, as we leave here tonight, help us to leave with, with a mind and a heart set to wait for you. And a heart set to look for you. To look around. Instead of what is being presented to us, the negativity and, and the problems and the heartache and the burdens, help us to look past that and beyond it, around it, look for your presence. That we might find your hand at work even in those situations that we might consider to be dire. God, we pray that we, you would use us this week to point others to Christ. That he might be lifted up and exalted in our lives and draw others to him as well. For we ask it all in his dear and precious name. Amen. What a blessing.